Hey guys, welcome back to the Bet Monkey Show. And before I talk about today's topic, I wanted to quickly address what's currently happening in the world today with the pandemic. And I cannot mention its name because uh, YouTube will demonetize this video. That's how YouTube works. But you know what I'm talking about. So I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you're staying healthy and that uh, you will be safe from the virus and that uh well hopefully it's not going to impact you too drastically it's impacted every one of us negatively one way or the other but i'm hoping and praying that uh, we are able to write it out and uh it will end sooner rather than later but speaking of today's uh actual topic i think you're going to love this video especially if you're someone who struggles to make uh, design changes on your website the plugin i'm talking about here is called the css hero and this really is a superhero wordpress plugin because with this plugin you can actually customize any anything on your wordpress website whether it's your logo your menu items your text images your background video whatever you can make design changes without ever having to write any piece of code so with css hero the way it works is that you simply point on an element, maybe it's a logo or uh, a piece of text, you point on that text, you select it, and then you make your design change. Maybe you want to make your color, you may, maybe you want to change the color, maybe you want to make the text bigger, or maybe you want to add some animation, anything you can think of, you can do so with this particular plugin. It is fantastic. Now, before you get too excited, it's not free, it's actually a paid plugin, but the good news though is that it's actually very cheap. Uh, you can actually get the license for just uh, $19. I'm trying to get down to the page where, ah, here it is, pricing option. So for one site, you can actually just get it for 19 bucks. It's actually that cheap. And if you have multiple sites, well, they have another license for five sites at $39. So this is a very affordable plugin. And believe me when I say, this is one of the kind of WordPress plugins that um, pain, painful is actually worth it. If you don't know CSS, if you're a kind of person who struggles to make design changes, this plugin will save your life. So coming up, I'm going to walk you through exactly how the plugin actually works. How do you use the plugin to make design changes? But before we even get into that, I'm going to give you a quick crash tutorial on CSS cascading style sheets. I'm going to walk you through the basis because the truth is, if you don't know at least, at least the basics of CSS, uh, you might struggle to use this plugin. So don't worry, it's just going to be very, very quick, about five or six minutes. I'll walk you through the basics of CSS, and then from there, you'll be ready to kick ass with this plugin. Now, of, of course, if you already know CSS, and you just want to learn how to use the plugin, I do have the timestamps in the description box below, so be sure to use that to your advantage. So I'm super excited. I think this is a tutorial that and a plugin that you will find immensely useful. So without further ado, let's get started with how you can use the CSS Hero plugin. Okay, so before we actually get started with the lesson, I wanted to quickly address some questions that you might possibly have regarding this plugin. So first things first, the plugin is compatible with just about every WordPress theme out there. It's been tried and tested with your themes like uh, Astra, Avada, Ocean WP, the X theme, Storefront, and so on. It's more than likely that the plugin will work with your theme. And if it doesn't for one reason or the other, they do have a 30 day back money guarantee. So you have nothing to lose by trying out the plugin. Uh, second is the fact that it's also compatible with uh, major page builders like Elementor, Beaver Builder, and so on. You shouldn't have any problems there. It's also a very lightweight plugin, meaning that it will not uh, increase the page load times of your website. So don't worry about slowing down your site as a result of using the CSS Hero plugin. One other thing through is that it is theme independent when it comes to updates. So you can make all the design changes you want and still update your theme whenever an update is available. So don't worry about that. However, if you change your theme to a different theme, you're going to lose the changes that you have made because the plugin actually pulls in the code that it needs to use to make those changes from the theme. And no two themes are designed exactly the same way. So please keep that in mind. If you change your themes, you will lose your changes, but there is nothing one can do about that really. There is no way of creating a plugin that will be uh, that will make such design changes on your site and then be completely independent of the theme. It doesn't work that way. So keep that in mind. Uh, one other thing to mention also is that you can in fact export the code, all the design changes you've made, you can export all that code 
and apply that code to another website running the exact same theme. It has to be the same theme. If it's a different theme, it's not going to work. So hopefully I've been able to address uh, the frequently asked questions. If you have any other specific questions which I've not uh, answered, please leave them in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer them uh, as soon as I can. One last thing to mention is that I am an affiliate for Cesar's Hero. So please, if you watch this tutorial and you feel like, you know what? I like this plugin. This is a plugin I will find very useful. I want to buy it. I will have my affiliate link in the description box below. What that means is if you buy the product using my link, I will get uh, some commission. So please, if you want to support me and help me out with my channel and help me with what I'm doing, please do use my affiliate link. I would really appreciate it. So that's it. Let's now get started with the actual tutorial. Well, okay, so welcome officially to the start of this tutorial on CSS Hero. But before we talk about the plugin, it is important that we talk about the basics of CSS because it is crucial that you know these basics because if you don't, you might struggle to learn how to use the plugin properly. Now, if you already know the basics of CSS, by all means, you can skip this lesson, move on to the next one where we begin working with the plugin. But if you don't know CSS or you're new to it, please watch this as I believe you'll find it very, very useful. Okay, let's start this very quick crash tutorial on CSS. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and it's basically used to apply styling to your website. Now, over here, you're looking at the homepage of one of my sample sites, themoviecharacters.com. Everything you see in here, the logo, the menu and the menu items, the drop-down menu items here, the images, the text, the video, Everything you see in here is what we refer to as elements. Elements are basically content. But then there is also elements that you don't directly see, and that's going to be the structure. You see, behind the scenes, there is actually a container, which is mostly the header that holds the logo on the left right here, and then the menu items on the right. So you basically have a container holding both of these elements, but then you could also have another container that will hold all this content. Basically, the three accepts for these three posts are the sidebar on the right with all the widgets. You could have one massive container holding all these elements, but then you could also have another container inside of that massive container that will specifically hold your widgets on the right right here, for example. So structure is another kind of element that is also affected by CSS. You don't see it, but it's right there. Now, all these elements, you can apply something known as properties to those elements. As an example, let's say, for example, in here, where you've got the uh, Spectre Review, this is probably maybe an H1 or an H2 tag. We could decide to change the way it looks. Right now, it's, it has the black color, but we could decide to change it from black to red. Right that, there, right there is a property, that's the color property. And of course, properties will also have values. So right now, the color property is set to black, but we could change it to red. We could change the font family property. Right now, it's probably Lato, maybe. We could change it to Times New Roman or Montserrat, for example. We could change the size. Maybe this is 16 pixels. We could make it 24 pixels. That would be the change in the font size property, as an example. So the kinds of properties you can apply to elements will depend heavily on what kind of element you're actually dealing with. As an example, in here we've got the image of James Bond with his car. You cannot apply the font family property because it's an image. You're not dealing with text right now. So applying a font family property to an image will make absolutely no sense. However, over here where you have the header holding the logo and the menu items, you could apply a background image to that particular element. It's possible, right? But you can apply a background image to text. You can apply a background image to an image itself. It doesn't make any sense. So again, the kinds of properties you can apply to elements will depend heavily on the actual elements involved. Now, one final thing to talk about before I round this up is the fact that you do have CSS classes and IDs. What exactly are these? Well, Say, for example, where you have the Spectre Review tag, let's say I wanted to change the color from black to red, make the font size 24 pixels, and maybe change the weight from 300 to, let's say, 500 as an example, right? But then what if I also wanted to apply those exact same changes 
to the Johnny English review. Rather than me coming in here, applying those properties and, and the values to the Spectre review, and then coming down here, doing, repeating myself, I can just create a single class and then say any element that has this class, apply these properties and the values to them. That right there is a class. So with a class, you can target multiple elements at the same time using the exact same uh, properties and the values. And a class is identified by a dot. So for example, I can create a red class that will be dot red, and then I can say, okay, any element with the class dot red, change its, its font size to 24 pixels, make its color red, and make its weight 500, just as an example. So that's it for classes. But what about an ID? ID, on the other hand, are used to target one specific element. So going back to the previous example of the Spectre Review tag, the Johnny English, let's say we also added the Aquaman uh, makes 900 million tag as well. So all these three titles are under the red class, for example. But then what if you wanted to give one additional property specifically to the Aquaman uh, makes 900 million tag? Let's say the property is going to be, you want to change its uh, text from normal to uppercase. What you can do is you can create an ID, call that ID, let's say uppercase, for example, right? And then you can say the element that has this ID of uppercase, transform its text from normal to uppercase. And IDs are represented with the hashtag symbol. That's how you would identify an ID. So once again, classes target multiple elements IDs target one specific element. So of course, there's a lot more to CSS than what we just talked about, but hopefully I've been able to give you a bit of an insight to how CSS works. So let's now take a look at how the CSS Hero plugin uh, actually works. All right, so go ahead, download, install, and activate the plugin. And as you can see right now, I have activated my CSS Hero plugin. I'm gonna go over to the homepage and you would notice that the CSS Hero link is now on the admin toolbar. To launch CSS Hero, just simply click on that link and you will see this message telling you that it's loading and voila. So now CSS Hero has been loaded and this is basically the admin bar for CSS Hero. So over here to the left, we do have the visual editor for CSS Hero, but then you also have the inspector tab where you can actually see the real CSS code uh, behind the scenes. So the way the CSS Hero tab works is that you click on any element. So as an example, I can click on the logo. And now that I've clicked on the logo, I now have access to different properties, the background, typography, borders, border radius, spacings, and so on. Note, however, that regardless of the element you click on, you will always have access to the exact same properties. This does not mean that all these properties are available for that particular element. Like I said, with an image, for example, you cannot apply typography properties to an image. That's not going to make any sense. So I just wanted to uh, point that out there. So let's say, for example, we wanted to make some changes to the menu items in here. I can click on the about link, for example, and I can go to typography. And uh, let's say the font size right now, it's set to 15 pixels. I can simply come in here right now and let's make that to, let's say 20 pixels. So you can now see they're now uh, a lot bigger. You could change the weight as well from 400 to let's say 600, for example. Now you can see it's a bit bolder. Uh, note, however, that the values for the weight will depend on the font family you're using. Uh, some font families might not have a particular kind of value. Let's say uh, 500, for example, might not be available for the particular font family you're using. So right now you can see we've made changes to the font size, the uh, weight as well for the menu items. And that's basically the way it works. You simply click on an element. And then if you go in here, you will have access to different properties for that particular element. And then you can begin making your styling changes. Of course, we'll talk a lot more about this as we progress in this tutorial. You do have this very small but useful button. It's the detach editor. So you can click in there and now you can simply move this editor around if you wanted to, if you prefer it this way. But I'm gonna go back and lock the editor in place. Now in here, you do have the media queries. Very, very useful, very important for responsive design. So you can change the screen size 
and then begin to make, to make design changes accordingly to that particular screen size. So this is, I believe, for like uh, an iPad size. This would be more for like a mobile device, or your mobile phone, for example. And of course, this is the smallest at uh, 320 uh, pixels. Now, speaking of media queries, uh, if you go to uh, project, you do have the media query manager where you could actually set a custom uh, dimension. So maybe you're designing for a very particular kind of device. Maybe the width is uh, 468 pixels and then the maximum width is, let's say, uh, 900 pixels. You know, you could add uh, stuff like that. It's available for you. Over here, you do have the edit and navigate functions. Edit right now simply means that we're making edits to this page. But what if we wanted to go to the about page as an example? You can simply come in here, click on that button. Now navigate is on. We can go to the about page. And then once we're in the about page, we can go back in here, switch back to edit, and now begin to make edit changes specifically for the about page. That's how this uh, actually works. Let's go back to the home page. All right, now switch back, edit. Now in here, you do have three very useful tools, the undo, the redo, and of course the history tab where you can take a look at all the changes I've made thus far. So if I click in here, for example, I can begin to view the change I made. So you can see right here, this is where I made the uh, weight a bit bolder. So I can go back, switch back to the normal weight that it was. And then if I go back further in my history, you can see this is where I begin. I began to change the size of the menu items and so on. So very, very useful uh, three tools for you right there. All right, let's move on to the checkpoints tool. Now, what exactly does this do? Well, let's say, for example, you were designing a website for a client and you wanted to design the homepage in two different ways. What you can do is you can apply the first styling design, save it as uh, checkpoint one, and then go back to the home page, redesign it with the second uh, design style, and then save that one as checkpoint two. And then when you're ready to show the client, you can load checkpoint one. They see the styling in there, and then you can then load checkpoint two. They will then see the alternative uh, styling. That's exactly how uh, checkpoints work. So you can save a checkpoint, and then you can load uh, checkpoints. Moving on to product, we've talked about the media query manager. But then you've got the selectors tree, very, very useful tool. You click in there and right now you can see the underlining structure, the backbone of this entire page. So you can see the granddaddy container, the main container containing everything. And then you've got the page element, site header and so on. And you can see it goes all the way down here to the footer. Now, in certain cases, when you click on this uh, selectors tree, you might not see everything. One trick is you can scroll down to the footer of your website, click on any of the elements in your footer, then go back to a project and then click on selectors tree and then you will see all the elements laid out for you. That's one trick that you can apply uh, in here just in case you don't see uh, everything. But let's go all the way back to the top and let's see how this works. So when you begin to hover down the hierarchical structure, you may begin to notice that your page begins to get highlighted. As an example, I'm on site header right now, but then notice that there is now a black border telling you that, hey, this site header controls this particular area of this page. Now, if I keep scrolling down, the next three or four tags also control the same area. But then if I come down here to site branding, now you can see only the logo is now highlighted. This tells me that the logo is contained in here. If I keep scrolling down, now you can see our header, main layout, one AST main header. This controls the menu items. And that's exactly how this works. So it allows you to quickly identify which containers are holding which particular elements. And it's also very useful because let's say for example, I wanted to apply a certain background color to the container containing both the logo and the menu items, I could come in right now and say, uh, let's see, okay, I know that the uh, site header contains both elements. So I'm gonna click on site header. I can come over here right now to where I have properties, click on background, and now color, I can click on color, I click in box right here, and let's say I can go with red. 
but you may notice that there is no change the background is still white well in this scenario maybe this wasn't the actual element we should have applied this property on so what you can do is you can go over to the next element in the structure so this one's not, now is going to be the uh, main header bar wrap i can click in there try to apply the same thing again red that doesn't work ha, okay let me click okay go back to the next one which is now main header bar let's try again and now you can see this is the actual element where you can apply the background color to. So this is why the uh, this structure is very, very important. It allows you to identify which particular elements, are, which particular tags or containers are holding uh, some particular elements. I'm just going to go ahead and you can see the CSS change down here. Uh, background color, and that's the value. I'm just going to go ahead and reset by deleting that so it goes back to white but again in here you can see it goes all the way so you can see uh, AST separate container primary contains this particular section that has the blog posts if I scroll down here secondary for example right now contains the widgets you can see when I hover on secondary the secondary area is highlighted in this uh, light blue so that's basically how uh, this works let's close that go back to project Product variables are a bit complicated. We'll talk about this a bit later. But then you've also got the manage Google fonts where you could decide to add a Google fonts into your library. So you've got the different uh, categories, sans serif, serif. So if I wanted to add uh, ABZ, for example, I'll simply click on the button right there and I've added ABZ. I can now begin to use ABC on my website. That's how that works. Uh, what else do we have in here? We've got tools. So you could view the page as and unlogged in user you could decide to style the login page and you could also reset the theme edits if you wanted to and then of course you've got the uh, quit button where you can decide to quit and stop using CSS hero so that's basically the introduction to the CSS hero uh, plugin the admin tools uh, join me in the very next tutorial where we begin to walk with the plugin itself and make our styling changes to our website Okay, so what I want to do right now is to walk you through all these properties and the kinds of values you can apply to them. Note, however, that this is not going to be extensive because if I wanted to cover everything fully, I could spend the next two, three hours just walking you through each one of them because this is CSS uh, almost in its entirety. So we don't have that time, but what I will do is walk you through each one of them quickly and explain to you the values that you can apply to them. So. Let's start off with the background and to demonstrate, I'm going to use the container uh, containing both the logo and the uh, menu item. So I have clicked on the white background right there. I've clicked in there and you can see this is the container that's been chosen. Okay. So on the color, again, you can just come in here and then choose, you know, a background color for your container. For image in here, you do have access to a gradient. If you click on the drop down arrow in here, you can see the different kinds of gradients are available for you. I usually don't use gradients, but hey, this will depend on your own preference and what you're trying to achieve. For actual background images, you can click on the plus button right here, and then you'll have access to a service known as Unsplash. This, you can get free images with Unsplash. Note, however, that to navigate your way around here, you will need to use the navigational buttons on your keyboard. The scroll button on your mouse will not work. So let's say, for example, I wanted to use this image uh, down here, for example. I'll click in there, and then you have the apply image, and then you can choose a size, so medium. That's how uh, you can use the Unsplash service. Now, you could come in here and then click on your media, and then you could also choose the file from your computer. However, this doesn't work for me because when you when I choose an image, it doesn't upload. So I don't know what's happening here. Maybe it might work for you. But a solution is if you're going to use an image from your computer, you can upload the image first to your media library and then you'll be able to access uh, the image from there. All these images you're seeing right here, these are from my own media library and I do have quite a lot. In fact, I'm going to make use of this image of Robert Patrick from the movie Terminator 2, awesome movie. So 
Let's use that image as an example. Now note that you can never have both a gradient and a background image applied at the same time. You can either have one or the other. You can have both. However, you could have a background color and a background image applied at the same time. What will happen in such a situation is that the background image will be displayed first and then if there are any parts of the container not covered by the background image, then the background color will now appear. I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a moment. Over here, you've got the position where you can choose what part of the image you want to focus on. So I'm going to click on the center right here. And now you can see the focus has switched. Now we can see uh, the T1000's uh, evil uh, pair of eyes right there. That's how position works. You can change the focus of the angle, but I'll keep it on, on center right there. Now with tile, you can choose to either constantly repeat the background image until it covers the entire container or just choose to not do so. By default, the background image will always repeat. But if you click on X right here, now you're saying, hey, do not repeat the background image. Notice what has happened in here. Now you can see the background color of red now appearing at the edges. That's because this right here is what the background image can cover. And since we are not repeating the background image, the background color now appears in areas not covered by the background image. Also, note that as we are applying all these properties, the actual real CSS code is being printed down here where you have the code editor. For, so, so as an example, this was the background color we chose. This was the background image and its source. Background position, we set it to the center. And now back and repeat, we said no repeat. So these are the actual CSS properties and the values being printed for you. In here, you've got the background size, all right? So the default value here is usually the uh, auto. Uh, we don't see it yet, but if I come in here and I chose the second value in here, you can see right now the background size set to cover, but then you, all, you have another value here known as contain. You can see that, right? So what's the difference between cover and contain? With cover, basically you are saying, hey, I want the background image to always occupy the full width and height of its container no matter what. Even in situations where the background image is not big enough for the container, stretch the background image until it's able to cover the full container. That's basically how cover works. With contain, on the other hand, you're saying, hey, always show the full image at all times. I don't care if it doesn't contain, if it's if it's not able to contain uh, the size of its own container, just display the full image at all times. That's why right now with contain, you can see the T1000 played by Robert Patrick and the background in there. By the way, if you haven't seen this movie, it's Termin Terminator 2, my favorite movie of all time. Please uh, do watch the movie after you finish taking this out. Uh, a class on CSS Evil, right? It's a great movie. So that's basically the difference between the cover and contain. Usually you want to go with cover. Just make sure that your background image is uh, big enough for its container. You've got blend mode, which I will not go into because of time, but you've got scroll where if you chose fixed, for example, in here, and note that if I begin to scroll down, notice, however, that the background image is not scrolling up as normal, right? You can see it doesn't scroll up with the rest of the page. So that's fixed, but scroll basically, which is the default value, uh, the background image will scroll up just like normal. Note also that the kinds of values you choose for certain properties can affect the way other properties work. Remember that we chose the position to be center. That's where you can see his eyes. But if you change this right now to fixed, right now position becomes uh, almost kind of like uh, irrelevant because it doesn't really change anything. So uh, note that the kinds of values you choose for certain properties may affect the values of other properties. So keep that in mind. All right. So that's basically it for the background properties. Let's now go over to the next property, which is typography. Now with typography, basically this deals with your text essentially, right? So let's use the spectra review, uh, header right here as an example. So again, you have access to changing the color. You can change the font size, make it really, really big or really small. You can change the line height, uh, change the font family in here. You can click on add fonts. And again, this will give you access to the Google fonts 
and from here you can choose to add uh, any font of your liking. Over here you've got the style where you can change from normal to italic, so you can see that's the italic variation. You can also transform to capital letters if you wanted to, or transform all to small letters. You've got decorations, alignments as well. Note, however, that the alignment here is affected by its container. So in certain situations, this might not actually work. It all depends on how the container has been designed, but that's a bit more uh, complex. You've also got letter spacing, and you can increase this or decrease it. Again, th again this will depend on the, usually on the font family you choose. Uh, you've got word spacing, which doesn't seem, okay, it's actually working. You can see there's a bit more of a space between uh, Spectre and Review, so that's how uh, word spacing would work. And then you've got uh, text shadow. Uh, you can click on make shadow in here, and then uh, over here you can choose a particular color, let's say blue for example, and then you can add like a blurred effect. You can see the way that actually works. So yeah, <laughs> you can also ch change the angle of the focus, give it kind of like a, some interesting uh, effects. So usually personally, I don't work with text shadow that much, but hey, you're more than welcome to spend time uh, playing with these values, but uh, that's basically it for the typography. Uh, let's come down here to borders. And what I'm gonna do is let's also use the Spectre Review here as the sample. So with border, you can add border at the top, to the sides as well. Uh, if you chose the very first value in here, that's border width, this will affect all four sides. So you can add a border width, which would be the thickness of the body. You can see right now 14 pixels, that's kind of uh, very, very heavy. Let's bring this down to five, let's say four pixels. Again, you've got the border color, make it red, you know, and of course you can also choose the kind of border style you want to go with. You've got that available for you. This works very, very well with uh, containers uh, usually. Let's go over to the very next, which is going to be border radius. Ah, for you to see how this works, let's actually go back and apply uh, an actual border. So, okay, we've got that one. Let's go back in here. With border radius, you can add or you can circle the corners of the border. So if I chose the very first box in here, as you can see right now, I've chosen 20 pixels. You can see right now that the edges are now beginning to curve. That's because we've, we're working with this value in here. If you wanted to curve only, let's say for example, the top right corner, you can simply come in here and then choose in there, choose the value. And now you can see that the top right corner in here is the only one that's been uh, curved as a result. So that's how our borders and the border radius uh, essentially work. All right, so let's move on to the very next property, which is going to be that of the spacings. Now to explain spacings properly, let's go back and apply uh, a border to our Spectre review. So let me just add four pixels or yeah, let's say five pixels. Okay, and let's go back. So with spacings, you have access to paddings and then margins. Patterns basically will create space between an element and its borders. Note that with the Spectre Review, the text is right at the edges of the border to the left, right here and to the right. So if I came in right now and began to apply padding, you can see right now there is beginning to be, to be more space between the text and its borders. That's how padding works. So you can either choose to apply padding to all four sides at once with the first box in here, or you can target specifically either the top side, the right, left, or bottom. Margins are a bit more tricky. Margins allow you to create space between one element and the next element. So an example here would be, uh, let me just come over here and bring this back to let's say two pixels. So let's say for example, you wanted to create space between uh, the Spectre review text and let's say the meta information down here where you have leave comments, action movie reviews by movie and so on. If you come down here to imagine bottom and you try increasing this, uh, note that nothing seems to be happening, okay? It could be that you're choosing the wrong element to target. Actually, you can't apply margins to text. You can apply to the container, however. So note that if I clicked on the space outside in here, I click in there right now, and I try adding some margin to the bottom. Note now that it's actually working, okay? If I tried from the top, the top doesn't seem to be working. But what, what I can do is, if I wanted to create space between Spectre Review and the James Bond image, I can try clicking on the James Bond image 
and then try applying margins to the bottom of it. So you can see right now, the spectacular view now is falling uh, further below the background, uh, the James Bond image. So margins are a bit more tricky than patterns. Just remember that whenever you're trying to apply spacing using margins, if one if applying margins to one particular element doesn't seem to work, try applying it to either the element on top of it or the element below it, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with the uh, margins. So that's it for margins and patterns and spacings. Uh, transform, these work best with uh, images. So let me choose the logo in here. And in here with transform, you can create some really uh, fantastic effects. You can make an image bigger, make it smaller. You can do like the translate thing and like change its position. You can see <laughs> the way this works very, very crazy. Or you can even go with rotate and then like create like really crazy effects right here. You can see how that works. You've also got the skew, which gives you this kind of like this 3D dimensional uh, effect. You can see how that works. Some really, really, really amazing uh, things you can do with this value. So feel free to spend time playing around with the transform values. Uh, filters, again, this is like your TV. You can make contrast. Uh, make the colors introverted, add some opacity or, you know, saturation and so on. Uh, that's filters. Uh, lists, this will depend on actual lists that you're working with. I don't have an example for you, but basically you can ch choose the list style type from disk to circle. You can even apply uh, an image for your lists as well. And you can change the position from inside to outside. I wish I had uh, a list for you to demonstrate this one, but I don't. But it's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to figure out how this works with your lists. Uh, next, you've got extra. Now with extra, you can choose to add a box shadow. Click on make shadow in here. Choose your orientation, choose your color, choose the spread values, blurs, the position. You can create some very interesting effects with the uh, shadows. Let me just remove this. You've got visibility where you can... I'm, I'm sorry, before visibility, you've got float, which is unfortunately beyond the scope of this lesson visibility you can choose to just simply hide an element for one reason or the other we'll keep it invisible you can change the opacity values as well make it really really opaque or not depends on you box sizing beyond the scope of this course unfortunately uh display i would recommend you don't change this however in certain situations situations you may want to go with none a good example would be if you're designing your website for responsive, maybe for like a mobile device and you have like sliders, for example, sliders don't do too well on mobile devices. So you could choose to specifically not display an element when it's viewed on a mobile device. We'll talk about this a bit later when once we begin talking about responsive design uh, transition beyond the scope of this course, unfortunately. So uh, that's basically it for extra measures. This <laughs> unfortunately is also beyond the scope of this uh, lesson. But basically in here, you can choose to increase the heights of your containers, increase their width. It's a bit complex and uh, let's not spend time talking about that. And uh, positioning also, again, is quite advanced. But basically, I'm just give you a very, very quick uh, demonstration of what you can do in here. If for one reason or the other, you wanted to position an element at a very specific point on your website, you can come in here, change position from static to let's say, absolute okay and now here you can choose like the values and choose specifically where you want to display that particular element honestly i would highly recommend you don't play with this because it's very very complicated and you could break uh, the way your site actually looks like so i'll highly recommend you don't play with the position values so that's basically it for the uh, properties and different values. Of course, I could have spent much, much more time talking about this, but that will take way too long. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed the quick crash tutorial on CSS properties and their values, but let's take a closer look at how the CSS Hero plugin actually works. So like I've said before, the general idea is that you click on an element and then over here to the left, you're able to add uh, stylings based on the properties and the values uh, associated with those particular properties. But notice that whenever you hover your mouse around your web page, you will notice that containers 
or borders begin to appear. As an example, I'm hovering my mouse and this white space between the logo and the menu items. Notice over here now that there is a class called the dot header dash main dash layout dash one dot main dash header dash container. That's basically the class of containers occupying or containing the logo and the menu items. But if I move my mouse over to the logo, notice now that the class has now changed to dot site dash header uh, a i m g. That's basically what's holding this particular uh, logo. So the idea is to allow you to quickly spot which container is holding what content. If I move my mouse down here, for example, notice that this has now changed to .ast container, and this basically contains both the posts, the excerpts of the posts, and also the sidebar widgets. But if I move my mouse inside this white box, notice now it has now changed to .ast separate container. That's basically the container containing only uh, the accept content. If I move my mouse over to the right, now you can see this has now changed to uh, hashtag secondary. That's the container holding these widgets. And of course, if I scroll down, choose one spe specific uh, container in here, you can see down this one is specifically .rpw-time, representing the time this post was uh, posted and so on. So like I said, again, the general idea is that you are able to quickly identify which container is containing which content. Now down here, you will notice there are a lot of different containers already available for us. These are the containers basically containing content based on what, what we're currently looking at. Now, if I come down here, let's go all the way down to the footer and I click in here. Notice now that the containers here have now changed. There are fewer because we're now focusing specifically on the footer area of our website. But again, this is another quick way to quickly identify which containers are containing the information on the area you're currently uh, working on. So again, you pick an element, you come over here, you apply the properties. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, let's apply typography, change the color here to uh, green as an example. You come down here and you will now notice that the CSS code has now been applied uh, to that particular element. So whatever you do over here where you have your uh, properties, once you have applied a property and its value down here, the CSS code will automatically uh, be printed out. That's basically how the plugin works. But take a look at this, all right? Let's say, for example, I came in here right now. You would notice that when we hover over an element, you might see something appear at the top right here. In this case right now, you can see it says uh, dot entry dash content P. This basically is the class representing this particular uh, text. So let me just click inside. Let's select that one. Let's go to typography and let's make this a little bit bigger. So 17 pixels. Let's go ahead, click on save and publish. Okay. Now, if I go back in here, notice now that the bar on top here has now changed. Now it's in blue and you can see the word they edited. So basically now this is telling us that this particular element has been edited. So this is a good way to remind yourself of which elements you've edited and those that you've not. Remember, those edited will have the blue bar on top. Those not edited will be uh, dark, as you can see right now. Spectre review is dark. That's because we've not edited it. Okay, let's take a look at something in here. In fact, I'm going to make this a bit bigger. Let's increase the size here to 20 uh, pixels, all right? Now, if I come back here, you would notice that the other excerpts, the ones for Johnny English, and also down here, the one for Aquaman have all become uh, 20 pixels as well. That is because they all belong to this class of dot entry dash content P. Notice when I hover my mouse over here, you can see it has that exact same class right there. Let's go back to the top over here to Johnny English. You can see the exact same class there as well. So basically any properties we apply to this particular class will affect all these excerpts. Remember, that's how classes work. But the question I might have here is, what if you only wanted to target specifically the excerpt for the Spectre review? Now, we've talked about IDs, but in this case, we're not going to start applying IDs to the particular element. Instead, 
what you can do is you can right click on the element and now in here you will see this option of only this element. So you click right there and now you will notice that the CSS text in here has now changed completely. You can see right now it's very, yeah, this kind of looks like Greek, you know, but <laughs> it's now way more complicated than the initial uh, dot entry dash content P class that we had earlier. So now over here, if I come in here and say, you know what, I'm gonna change the color here from black to let's say red as an example, and I click OK. Now if I scroll down here, you would notice that the accepts for Journal English and Aquaman have not changed, but that's because we've specifically only targeted the accept for Spectre. And you might also notice over here that the hashtags are now being used for page content primary. And there's a bit more to this than what I've just said regarding why this particular element has been targeted specifically, but you get the point. You can simply right click on an element, choose only this element, and then whatever styling you apply will be uh, will be applicable only to that specific element. Okay, let me go ahead and close this. Let's remove that. Let's come up here and let me show you something very, very cool. Now with the menu items, usually many websites have this uh, design where when you, when your mouse hovers on a menu item, it either changes its color or it becomes underlined. A way to basically highlight which menu item is being uh, hovered on. In that case right now, what you want to do is you want to deal with the states. Over here where you have state, you've got none and you've got hover. So let's say for example, I clicked on this menu item. Now if I come back here, you can now see we now have four. You've got none, which is the basic uh, default value, but then you've got hover, active, and then visited. So let's say, for example, we wanted to create an effect where when you hover over a menu item, it becomes underlined. What I'm gonna do is let's just click on the element, and now for state, I'm gonna click on hover. So you can see hover has now been selected. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and let's see what we can do. Decoration, basically, that's what we're after and you can see on the line. You can see the CSS declaration right here, text decoration is on the line. When we now hover over the menu items, you can see the hover effect uh, right there. We could do something else. Let's also, we could make, make it bold maybe. So 800, and we could even change the color. So let's go with, uh, let's go with red. Red is usually uh, a good color to go with. Okay, so now let's see the changes. When you hover, uh, let me just click OK here. OK, so you come back here right now. So you can see right now the three effects taking place. It becomes bold, the font size increases. I'm sorry, it becomes bold. Uh, the text is underlined and then the color changes to red as you can see. So that's basically how you can apply effects based on the state of the element. So for menu items, you actually have access to more. You've got the active and then also the uh, visited active would be the menu item whose page you're currently on. A visited would be menu items that you've uh, just visited in the past before moving on to a new uh, menu item. That's how these work. Awesome, all right. Let me show you something else that's really cool. Now, when you hover your mouse on most elements, you might notice this particular uh, feature right here where you have like a rectangle and then two arrows pointing up and down you could apply margins and paddings using this particular tool. Remember we talked about margins and paddings. Margins are used to create space between one element and the other. Paddings are used to create space between an element and its border. So if I click right there on that, you can now see we now have access to like a light green color and then a blue color. Notice the symbol that appears when I hover my mouse right there you can see now this particular symbol right here this is the one for margins if i scroll further down just move my mouse further down a bit this one right here becomes the one for padding so as an example i've got the padding selected i'm going to move down okay so now you see that's blue that's basically padding and then let me come down here all right you can see right now that padding has now been applied padding top is now 29 pixels right there Let's go back in here. 
click and let's come down here now i'm going to apply some margins and well there you go margin bottom of 40 pixels so this is how you can apply margins and patterns without having to go to uh, the uh, properties of margins and then apply the values they can just simply do so directly here again just click on this symbol right here the rectangle with the two arrows and then once i selected this particular symbol right here would be for the patterns and then the one up here that's the one for margins margins are in green patterns are in light blue so that's how you can apply margins and patterns to your elements let's talk about an amazing tool available with the css hero plugin and that's going to be the project variables tool but what exactly are variables and why would you want to use them let's say for example you wanted to apply particular style to more than one element so let's say for example uh, the text here that says Bruce Willis was for the ninth time let's say we wanted to give it a very special color of uh, let's say something like greenish lime maybe okay this color let me go ahead and click OK now I'm gonna grab this color code right here let's just right click copy so let's say for example you wanted to apply the exact same color to the uh, leave a reply text down here all right so let me go over here apply the color and there you go right so now both leave a reply and Bruce Willis was for the ninth time have the exact same color but what if after a while you decide you know what I want to change this particular color for these two I want to change to something else so what you would have to do is you would have to come back here to Bruce Willis words for the ninth time. You come over here and uh, let's say, for example, now the new color is going to be like a uh, blue. You click OK. And then in order for that to match, you'll have to come down here as well and do the exact same thing, right? You'll have to go over here, change the color, press enter, and there you go. So basically, this is exactly what you would have to do in order to make the change to all the elements whose styling you want to match. But what if rather than you having to go to each individual element you simply make the change on one specific piece of code and it will affect every element that you wanted to apply that particular change in style to what am i talking about i'm talking about variables now take a look at this okay i'm gonna i'm gonna come over here where you have project i'll click on project variables now in here i can create a new variable let's create a variable for this particular color so I'm going to click on create new var. So let's say you can now add a name for the variables. So let's say uh, special dash uh, color. All right. And then the value, um, let's just say indigo. All right. Let's just say indigo is going to be the special color indigo. Let's go ahead now and add. We've now created the special variable called uh, special color. The value is indigo. Now, if I go back here, let's click on the Bruce Willis words for the ninth time. Over here, notice there is this symbol. It kind of looks like the at symbol. But if I click in there, check this out, and now have access to the special color of indigo. I can click in there. Now, Bruce Willis has the indigo color. I'll just come down here and then apply the exact same color. And there you go. Now. What if we wanted to change the color from indigo to a different color like we did previously? Rather than me going to leave a reply and then Bruce Willis words for the ninth time, I will simply come over here to my variable and then change the value in here to something else. Let's say, for example, our uh, orange. So that's going to be orange. Uh, press enter. And there you go. So automatically, every element we've applied the variable to becomes updated. Bruce Willis words for the ninth time is now in orange. And guess what? Down here, leave a reply is now in orange as well. So that's exactly how variables work. And note that it's not just for colors. You can apply, you can create variables for your font sizes, your font weight, your font family. You can add variables for borders. Basically, any one of these uh, particular uh, properties you can create variables for them and apply them over and over again for whatever elements you need to apply them to. So that's exactly how variables work with the CSS Hero plugin. Another wonderful tool that you can work with would be snippets in addition to variables. Now, variables, as wonderful as they are, are kind of limited in that 
you can only create one property and assign one value for that property using uh, a single variable. You can't have uh, multiple properties contained inside one single variable. But this is where snippets come into play. So let's say, for example, rather than just applying a simple color change, what if you wanted to apply a font size change, a font family change, a font weight change to a particular set of elements? And you can use snippets for those. So let's say, for example, I'm going to come back down here to the uh, Bruce Willis words for the ninth time. Now, I do apologize if I'm constantly making use of the exact same element, but the truth is our text are some of the most versatile kinds of elements in that there is almost no kind of property that you cannot apply to text. Text loves uh, different kinds of uh, properties. So let's make use of this. I'm going to click on the Bruce Willis words for the ninth time. And let's say, for example, I wanted to change the font size to, let's say, uh, 30, let's, let's say 40 pixels. Uh, the font family, let's say I'm going to go with uh, Palatino as an example. Uh, the weight, let's go with, uh, let's say, uh, 600. And let's also add the style of italic. And then let's also go with the uh, transform to uppercase. Okay, Down here, you can see all the properties we've uh, discussed, right? font size, font family, font weight, font style, and then text transform. Over here, you've got the store edits as snippet button. So I'm going to click on that button right there. And now over here, I'm going to change the name. So let's say, for example, this would be, uh, let's say, special fonts. Oh, well, let's just say font change, font dash change, right? Now take a look at this. It says, do you want me to replace the current element styles with this snippet as well? What this means is if you say yes, every element that has this particular class of uh, .ast-single-post.entry-title, every element that has this class will automatically uh, be affected by this particular properties and their values, all right? So be careful whenever you choose this uh, particular option. I'm just going to go with no and click on save. All right. Now take a look at this. If I wanted to apply all of these right now to, let's say, the recent posts title right here, I can click on the recent posts. And then up here where you have the properties, I'm going to come down here to snippets. Click on snippets. And then I'm going to come down here to your snippets. Click on your snippets. And there you go. You can see the special snippet we've created. I can either choose to preview or I can just go ahead now and apply. And there you go. So all these, the font size, the font family, font weight, all that stuff has now been applied to recent posts. So I could also come in here right now, click on modify snippet and then make whatever changes I needed to make either from the code editor or I can go over here and begin to make those changes. Notice that five is right next to properties. That tells you that we made or that we created this snippet from changing five uh, properties, which were, of course, font size, font family, uh, font weight, font style, and then text transform. So in addition to creating your own snippets, there are also pre-built snippets available for you. If you come back down here to, uh, let's go back up here where you have properties, come down here to snippets. Uh, you do have uh, snippets for buttons. So you click on buttons, for example, and for in here you've got the .btn-3d. And you will notice that this has like a background color of blue. It has some padding. There is a border radius as well attached for this particular snippet. Uh, this one has the exact same features as well, except this has a radiant for the background as opposed to the solid background color for this one. So you've got all those built out for you, which you can apply for your buttons. Uh, you've got for your text uh, clippers as well. Uh, what else do you have? You've got the uh, ones for shadows, dividers, uh, backgrounds, hover effects, and so on and so forth. So you can make use of these pre-built snippets or simply uh, create your own snippets by making use of the properties and then simply applying those snippets to whatever elements you wanted to apply them to. Let's move on to talk about animations and how you can add them to your WordPress website making use of the CSS Hero plugin. So let's say, for example, we wanted to animate, uh, let's say, the featured images of our posts right there. I'm going to click on the James Bond image first. 
Now to access animations, you're going to go over here and you will see animations just under your snippets. You click in there and now you can see the message. It says easily apply on scroll animations to the currently selected element. Animations are triggered when the user scrolls the page and the current element, which is the viewport. Basically, animations will be applied when you scroll down to where, towards where that element is located. So, in here you've got the basic uh, different kinds of animations uh, available for you. So the default, of course, is none. But you've got fade. Uh, you know, you've got fade left, fade up, slide up, slide down, zoom in, and all that stuff. So just as an example, let's go ahead and use the uh, slide right. All right. Now, let me just be clear. When this slide right does not mean that you're going to slide the element uh, to the right. It actually means the element is going to slide from the right. Okay. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Now, over here, you've got the easing effect. Okay. You've chosen the animation. Now, how would you like to show that animation? Are you going to go uh, basically linear, which will be very, very smooth, or will it be a bit more gentle with ease? Uh, you've got ease out, ease in, ease in and out, ease in back, different kinds of uh, <laughs> ease and effects. And I got to be honest with you, I have no idea what these do. Ease in cubic, uh, ease in out cubic, I have no idea, okay? I usually just go with linear because it's very simple, very basic. So I'm going to choose linear. Now over here, you've got four more additional properties that you can apply to your animations. Offset, we'll talk about that in just a moment because it's the trickiest. But delay basically refers to how much time needs to elapse before the animation actually begins to run. So in here, you've got values of 0, 50, 150, all the way up to uh, 1,000, uh, actually up to 3,000. So 3,000 here would be uh, 3 seconds because these are basically uh, milliseconds. So for the purposes of this video, let's go ahead and simply choose uh, just 1,000. Okay, so one second. Now, the duration refers to in how much time, once the animation has kicked, in how much time should the animation finish uh, running. So again, these are all in milliseconds. So in order to actually see the effect properly, let's go and choose, let's say 3,000 Okay, for three seconds. Now you've got once. And for once, you've got either true or false. What this one simply means is that would you like to run the animation once on that page or would you like to run it multiple times just as long as the user keeps uh, scrolling towards where that element is? For the purposes of this video, I'm going to choose uh, false because we're going to be testing out these values. All right. So finally, in here, you've got the uh, offset. In fact, let me just hold on on offset for now. Let's just go ahead and um, save and publish this. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and open up the site on a different browser. Let's use Firefox. And let's just go ahead now and save and refresh. I'm sorry. Okay, let's come down here now. And can you see, you can see right now, that is the animation right there. So you can see right now it's sliding to the right and not from the right, as you can see. So if I come down here, there you go. And that's the Aquaman uh, featured image. So you can kind of see what's happening right here. If I scroll up and I scroll, scroll down again, you can see the animation repeating itself. That's because we said that, hey, we don't want uh, we don't want the ones to, to be true. We want it to be false, which means that the animation runs uh, repeatedly. Remember that we also set a delay of one second before the animation kicks in and then the duration, the animation should complete in three seconds. That's why we are seeing uh, the effects of, uh, the, that's why we're seeing the way the, the uh, featured images are appearing. Now you might be wondering, okay, why is the James Bond image not running any animation? Remember that the animations would only run when we are able to scroll down to where that element is. When we refresh this page, Literally, the very first thing we see is the James Bond image. So no scrolling is involved here. That's why this featured image is not running the animation. But when we begin to scroll down, you can see the other featured images running with the uh, animation. So there you go. That's basically 
uh, that. Let me just go ahead and make uh, a few changes in here. Let's shorten the duration to one and a half second. And uh, let's try, let's remove a delay. We don't want any more delays, none. And let me just go ahead and try a different type of uh, animation. So we had slide right. Uh, let's try flip left. Okay, I have no idea what's going to happen here, but let's just go ahead, uh, save and publish. Okay, so now let's come down here again. Let me just scroll all the way to the top, refresh the page. And okay, so let's scroll down. Let's see. Oh, okay, so that's the, the flip effect. And there you go. All right. So that's basically the animations. Now let's come back over here and let's talk about this guy called the offset. The way offset works is that it acts like an anchor from which the animation will actually execute once we have scrolled down to a certain point. I know I'm not being very clear. Let me try and put it this way, okay? Let's try this, all right? First of all, offset, let's go with let me just come over here and go with, uh, let's say, 100, all right? Just bear with me. You're going to see what's going to happen. Let's go ahead, save and publish, all right? Now, if I come back down here to my Firefox browser, let's refresh the page, all right? Now, I'm at the very top right here, okay? As I begin to scroll down, I'm scrolling down, I'm scrolling down, I'm scrolling down. Look down there at the very bottom. We still can't see the featured image with uh, Johnny English, right? But as we keep scrolling down, you can see, okay, so at this point where we've scrolled down, this is where the animation actually triggers at this point right here, right? If I go back in here and I say, you know what, the offset, let's actually take this all the way. Uh, let's say all the way to 400 instead. All right, let's go ahead, save and publish. Now let's come back in here and let's see the difference, all right? So I'm gonna come back up here. Let's refresh the page, okay? So now I am going to scroll down. I'm scrolling down, I'm scrolling down, I'm scrolling down. Now, usually at this point, this is where the animation would have executed if we had used 100. But because we've chosen 400, we have to scroll down a bit more. You can see now we have to scroll down a bit more before the image now appears. That's basically how it works. Let's try one more example. I'm going to go back. And from 400, let's go all the way to the other end, minus 400. What this means is the featured image will appear a lot sooner when we're scrolling down. So let's go ahead, save and publish. Let's go back in here. Let's come all the way up here. Let's refresh. Now, remember when it was 400, we had to scroll down consider considerably. But over here, I'm scrolling down. I'm scrolling down. Now, we should see the image appear. Oh, you can see it has actually already appeared down there. So, you can see that's basically how offset works. It basically determines when the animation will run depending on how far down we are scrolled to that particular element. So, that's how... Uh, these values are uh, work. So there you go. That's it for the animations. Please, one thing I should mention here is that don't go gung-ho with your animations, okay? Just because you can animate an element does not mean that you must animate that element. Animations, if anything, can actually slow down your website because they require additional code for them to execute. So keep your animations to a bare minimum. Don't go gung-ho. Let's talk about responsive design. And the good news here is that I don't think you're going to spend as much time working with responsive changes because most WordPress themes are already designed by default to be responsive. However, there might be instances where you add additional content like maybe sliders or videos and your theme has not been designed to accommodate such content responsively. So it's a good idea to learn how to make such content responsive using the CSS Hero plugin. And I'm gonna show you how you can do that. So over here, where I've got the media queries, we've got the desktop view, the natural selection. And then the next two right here are for your tablets. 
and then the last two here are for your mobile devices. So let's say as an example, let me just go ahead and choose the smallest, which is the one for 320 pixels. Now, let's say for example, I wanted to hide this video and actually one of the design tips I can give you is that unless, unless a video is extremely important, don't display videos when or when viewed on a mobile device. They don't tend to do quite as well on, on, on mobile devices like they do on desktops. So videos and sliders as well. Sliders don't really do that well on mobile phones. They actually look kind of awkward. So one thing you could do is you could say, okay, specifically for mobile devices, I uh, don't show this particular element. So in this case right now, if I wanted to hide or not display this video, what I'm going to do is to simply select the video and I'm actually playing it now. <laughs> Let me just pause there. Okay. Let me try to play the video and okay. So here it is right here, WP dash video. I'm going to come down here to extra and then where I have display, I'm going to go ahead and choose none. Okay. So let me go ahead and let's go back up here. Now, if I click on the second, the second to the, the, to the last uh, option in here, the one for five, six, eight pixels. If I scroll down, notice that the video isn't there either. That's because whatever change you make to the screen size of 320 will also affect the screen size for five, six, eight, because these both represent uh, your mobile phones. But if I go to the tablet, you can see the video now appears. Okay, so it's not going to affect the views on tablet or on the desktop. So that's how that actually uh, works. Let me go ahead and save. Okay. And there you go. So let me just go ahead and uh, try to view the site on my desktop browser here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead now and minimize. So even at this range, the video is still playing, but then if I shrink my browser a bit more, now you can see the video has uh disappeared. So that's how uh, that works. Okay. Let's go back in here. What other changes can we uh, also make? Now, if I scroll all the way down here, let me just show you one other thing you can do with your uh, responsiveness. Let's say, for example, you've got, uh, let's say like the tags here, for example. Okay. It's possible that you might have content that are in line, in line, meaning that they stack up right next to each other. So all these tags right now, they are in line, but what you could do is in certain situations, you may want to display uh, one element per line. What that would mean is that you're displaying them as blocks. So as an example, if I came in here right now and I chose, let's say the 007 tag. Okay. Note by the way that this, whatever I apply here will affect all the other tags. Okay. So, if I go to display right now and I decide to say block, you can see right now that all the element, all the tags are now stacked up uh, under each other. So this is the block format. That's the difference between inline elements and block elements. Inline elements can stack up right next to each other, but block elements uh, will only stack, uh, will only stack uh, on, underneath each other, basically. So one element per line, that's how block elements uh, operate. So there might be instances where you might want to do something like this. Now you would also notice there is one additional option of the inline block. This basically is kind of like the best of both block and inline. The good, the good thing about inline blocks is that they allow you to basically display your regular inline elements as blocks, but also allows you to apply properties to inline elements that are only applicable to block elements. An example would be margins. So usually you cannot apply margins to inline elements. You can only apply margins to block elements. So if for one reason you wanted to apply a margin to a natural inline element, you could display that inline element as an inline block and then add the margins to that particular element. One more thing I should mention before I round up this video on responsive design is that whatever changes you apply to a certain screen size will also be applied to the screen sizes smaller 
than that particular screen size. What, what am I talking about? So let's say for example, I come in here and I choose the a tablet view for the max width of 768. So I've chosen this one. And let's just say for example, I wanted to um, hide this recent post title. I'm gonna click on the title and I will go, come down here to extra. And uh, let me just go ahead and say display none, okay? Now, this is for the tablet view, but if I go to the mobile view, the first one, and I scroll down here, notice the title has also gone, it's no longer there. And if I go to the smallest screen size of 320 pixels and I come down here, it is not there either. But if I go to a screen size bigger, which is the one for 1024, recent post is there. And of course, on desktop view, it is there, okay? But because we've applied the display none to the screen size of 768, any other screen sizes smaller than 768 will not display uh, the title, okay? Because 768 is bigger than any screen size smaller than it basically. So that's how a responsive uh, the design works. So keep that in mind. One last thing to also mention, and I forgot to talk about this earlier, is that if you're trying to display uh, elements as a block, like say, let's say for example, the tags over here as an example, right? Now I've already shown you that you can simply come in here and say display block, okay? But sometimes, even when you say display block, those elements might still be displaying on an, as, as, as inline elements. What you can do, and this is just a tip, what you can do is come over here where you have float, simply say float none. Okay, it's possible that your theme has already applied the float value of maybe left or, or right. So in this case right now, you can see I've chosen float left. And even though down here I've said display as block, but because I've chosen float left, the elements are now back to acting as inline elements. So I'm just putting this out there. Whenever you want to display elements as a block, you apply display block, it doesn't work. Simply come over here to float and then say float none and they should finally display as our uh, blocks. Okay, now in the same way you can apply styling specifically for your mobile devices, you can also apply styling specifically for the desktop. So the way this works is you would have to provide the value of a property first of all before you can set that value to appear only on desktop. So as an example, let me click on the logo in here and let's say I wanted to apply a border of two pixels, okay? And let's also apply some padding. All right, so let's go with, uh, let's just go with uh, four pixels of padding, all right? So let's say I only wanted this to appear in the desktop. What I'm gonna do is I can go back to where I have the borders, all right? And now in here where I have the border with notice, I now have three buttons. But that's because I've applied, I've given a value to this property. Without a value, you will not see these three options. So in here right now, you will see the, the desktop only. So I can click on desktop only, and now the border will only appear when viewed on a desktop. You can see right now, if I try to view this on the tablet device, you can see the border isn't there. And then on a mobile phone, it's no longer there. But if I go back to the desktop, it's going to appear. You might have also noticed some additional values in here. You have reset, which obviously will simply reset the value back to its original uh, state. But then finally, you would also notice that we had the important tag. Now this is advanced CSS, but basically, sometimes when you try applying a style to a particular element, for one reason or the other, you might notice that that styling is actually not been applied. The usual reason is because somewhere in your CSS code or somewhere in your theme, there is another code that's also providing the exact same uh, type of style to that element, but that particular code has more of a priority. So in order for you to say, hey, look, CSS, forget about the other code. I demand that my own code here, my own property and my own value takes priority. That's when you would use the important tag. Just simply click on important and you can sit down there important. But please only use this as a last resort. If you're applying your changes and you're seeing those changes being applied, there is no need to use the important 
tag. All right, so we've just about come to the end of this tutorial on how to use CSS Hero. Let me just provide you with some last, with a few last uh, tools available at your disposal. If you come up down over here to where you have tools, you do, you do have the ability to view the page you're currently editing as an unlogged user. Sometimes some themes might style a particular page or a particular piece of content differently as a logged user from the way to be styled as a uh, logged out user. So if you want to make sure that what you're seeing as a logged in user is the same as what an unlogged user will see, just click on view as unlocked and you will see if there were any uh, changes in there. You do have the ability to style the login page. So simply click on style login page and this should take you to the, uh, to the page right here. So from here right now, you can just click, you know, on any of the elements, you come over here and, uh, you know, you can add a background color if you wanted to, add a background image. You can click on the text right there, change the color to, you know, something else. It's all, <laughs> it's all depends on, on what you want to do with the uh, login page. And of course, finally, you also have access to the reset theme edits. So basically this will reset all your theme edits back to normal and um, that would be that. Finally, uh, let's just go back to actual page. Uh, you might also notice that whenever you try to right click on an element on your page, you will see this um, add selector. Basically what you're doing here is you're trying to simply create uh, some CSS code for that particular element. So down here, if you click on add selector, you can see this is the selector that will be created for this particular uh, James Bond image. So from down here, you can just say add, and then that will now be added to your uh, to your selectors basically. So if you come down here to inspector, uh, you will now see the actual uh, code or selector representing the James Bond image in here. And then from here, you can begin adding uh, your CSS code. It's not really necessary. This is more like for developers, in my uh, humble opinion. Um, that's basically it. Don't forget, of course, that you do have access to your undo, uh, your redo, and your history buttons as well. Very, very important, very useful for you. And then, of course, checkpoints where you can save uh, a lot of changes you've made and you can uh, load those changes uh, later on uh, after a certain period of time if you wanted to. So that's basically it for the CSS Hero plugin. Well, so there you have it. We've come to the end of today's tutorial on how to use the CSS Hero plugin to make design changes on your WordPress website. I hope you found the tutorial useful. And please, if you're going to buy the plugin, if you feel like this is a plugin you want to buy, please use my affiliate link in the description box below. Don't forget. And if you feel like this is a video that uh, people you know might find useful, be sure to share it with them. My name is Alex once again from WebMonkey and um, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for your safety. Stay safe out there and uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.